having an e-commerce business gave me tremendous flexibility. I tend to put in between a half hour and an hour a day into my business, which has been an incredible blessing. It allows me to live where I want to live. It allows me to spend my time writing books, which I really believe in. And the business does its thing. I literally sell products to people I've never met in a country I don't live in while I'm asleep. So it's been an <laughs> absolute blessing for me. Welcome to the Winning E-Commerce Experience Show. And now your host, Sharam Anver. Hello, welcome to our next episode. Today, we have an entrepreneur with two decades of experience in e-commerce and he's the author of four personal growth novels. David Mason, great to have you with us. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And you, and you, I remember you insisted I call you Dave. So, um, you know, if anybody writes to Dave, make sure you address him that way. Um, Dave, it's really good to have you. Um, I, I know that, uh, you know, it's a pretty uh, busy time and it's a kind of a crazy time for all of us. Um, I guess it's, an, it's probably one of those times where you feel validated to be in the e-commerce and online business, right? It is such a great time for e-commerce business. I think as a whole, people are buying less, but so many of my brick and mortar competitors have just had to close their shops entirely. So I think we're getting a higher percentage of a smaller market. So traffic has been up, sales have been up. It feels a little bit weird to be up in a time when so many people are down, but that's been the, the reality. I know. I mean, that's part of the reason why we're, we're talking today, right? Like we're saying, let's share the abundance. Let's, let's, let's try to help more and more people. Uh, I mean, that, that's part of the reason why we're trying to be constructive about it. Absolutely. And I'm, and I'm really glad to, um, you know, to, to have your time today. So tell us a little bit about who is Dave? Uh, why did you, um, you know, found Knobs? Uh, what, was that, what was the story behind that? So prior to find the, founding the Knobs Company, I was actually an attorney. Mm -hmm. I was a oh, litigator wow. for the Natural Resources Defense Council. And I really loved it. I was doing clean water, clean air, ecosystems preservation stuff, endangered species stuff. But I was young and single, and I looked at the lifestyles of the attorneys I was working with. And as much as I loved the work, I didn't want my life to look like theirs. I knew I wanted something else. I didn't want to be working such incredibly long days. Building a family was really important to me. And I knew that the hours I was putting in, they just weren't going to work once I transitioned to my life. So I also wanted to pick up and move to Israel. I'm having this call right now from Jerusalem, Israel, even though I'm from America. So having an e-commerce business gave me tremendous flexibility. I tend to put in between a half hour and an hour a day into my business which has been an incredible blessing. It allows me to live where I want to live. It allows me to spend my time writing books, which I really believe in. And the business does its thing. I literally sell products to people I've never met in a country I don't live in while I'm asleep. So it's been an <laughs> absolute blessing for me. And that's, it's, that's pretty much the dream, right? Like you, you, when you, so, so essentially what you're saying is you, you approach it from a lifestyle perspective. You, 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 you were in a situation and you try to anticipate what, what that's going to look like 20 years and the trajectory you were in. You were like, nope, that's really not for me. I need to change. And e-commerce was sort of like your ticket out of it. Exactly. Nice. Um, so, so tell us about sort of that, um, where did this idea come from? Because he, I mean, like as a concept, I think anyone, anybody listening in would think, hey, that sounds great. I've got my own dreams. I want to go, I don't know, move to Thailand or what have you. But I mean, the, the real, like, I mean, what I'm trying to say is the way you described it makes it sound so really easy, but I'm sure there's a lot of hard work that went behind it. You don't just suddenly wake up and you, you get to work only an hour a day on your business, right? So what was that journey like? Um, what did you do? How did you come up with the idea and how did you execute it? So I want to be very clear that I did not come up with the idea. Okay. The idea presented itself to me. And for me, I had sold so many different products online. I experimented with this. I experimented with that. And it was really just playing with lots of different niches. And through doing so, I learned a lot of skills about internet marketing. And ultimately, I wound up getting into this. I mean, literally, the story is I started off selling patio furniture. Mm -hmm. And I was doing really well on this one very rustic brand of patio furniture. And 
at a certain point, I went to visit the factory and they told me, you know what, you should sell our indoor furniture too. We make a really good line of rustic beds. Mm -hmm. So I started selling the beds. And at a certain point, I noticed I got a few big orders for people who were looking for them for mountain cabins because they were very rustic cedar log beds. So people were buying them for their cabins up in the mountains. So I said, mm -hmm. huh, maybe I should be advertising these to cabin owners. Maybe that would be a good idea. So I went online and I researched cabin owners okay. and cabin didn't come up very high, but kitchen cabinets did. So I started selling kitchen cabinets instead. And, but my kitchen cabinets didn't have knobs. So I wound up adding knobs to go with my kitchen cabinets, which I had just really stumbled upon. This is one of many dozens of different products I've sold over the years. And it's kind of where I found my niche personally. Mm. But because of this, I really encourage people when they want to start off in e-commerce, not to really sit and brainstorm and say, okay, where can I make the most money? That can come later. What I encourage people to do first, since there are so many skills to learn and the learning curve, I don't really expect people to make money right out of the gates with their first product. So I encourage people to start with a product that you either have a tremendous passion about because you're going to be spending a lot of time working on that or you have a tremendous amount of knowledge in. So it could be that you've worked in a certain area, you have a lot of knowledge in a certain product and that will make it easier. You won't have so much research. You've already got this expertise going in. So I tend to encourage people to make your first website, your first e-commerce stab, something you're not worried about earning money on. Look at it just as a learning experience because you're going to learn a ton. Mm. Once you've learned what works and what doesn't work, that's when you start saying, okay, now I kind of see better what I should go into. But don't try to go into a product you know nothing about and have no passion about and try to make that work right out of the gates because you're, you've got that huge amount of learning you need to do and it's not going to be enjoyable because you could care less about what you're selling and you're going to have to really dig deep to learn about it because you don't know anything about what you're selling. So start with a passion or with an area of expertise and make your first website just, it's a game, it's fun. You're just there to learn and give yourself a couple months of just learning. And then at that point, you could start to say, okay, now I'm starting to get a sense of, what I, of how this game works. I get a sense of what I can sell and what I can't sell. Now, what is a product that I can really maybe hit it big in? Because right. for me, I never ever conceived of selling the products I'm selling. And over the years, I've, I've, again, I've tried many things. I have my ability to predict what would work and what wouldn't is basically zero. That I, I have found almost no relationship, no correlation between what I thought would succeed and what I've been able to succeed in. So don't try <laughs> to be too smart and bright. Try to just go out there and put things up and start selling anything. And learn from there. And once the more expertise you get, the better decisions you'll make, the better your ability will be to choose the winning products. And I want to take a little bit of a moment here to compare and contrast what you just said with some of the content I'm seeing so much from these, you know, quote unquote, fake gurus that you find on YouTube and like all these other sites where they're like, yeah, start your drop shipping site today. You don't need to have any experience. You just need to follow my course and you're going to be making millions and you're going to be on a beach. Uh, I mean, it, it's a big pet peeve for me because one, it's really preying on vulnerable people saying, hey, like you're stuck. It's okay. You can make millions of dollars here. But just linking that to someone who's actually done it, it's really about learning and you need to know something about the product you're selling because that's the only way you're going to sound authentic on your site. So visitors coming to your site, if you don't know much about the product, I'm assuming uh, that they're going to smell something, you know, kind of off and probably not shop with you, right? Maybe. I'm not, I'm not totally convinced you need to have all that much expertise in your products. I don't have a tremendous amount of expertise in knobs, truthfully. I've <laughs> actually seen only a very small percentage of the products that I sell. So and what, it's what not you... hard to ask, answer, answer questions. You get a question and you, you can say, you know what? I don't know the answer to that. Let me call the manufacturer. I'll find out and I'll get right back to you. And people are pretty understanding of that. So where would you then link to the point you made there that if you're going to start selling a product, you either should have, you should really be passionate about it or you should have some form of knowledge about it. So, you know, if, if you so pick It has nothing two, to do with making the sale. It's not about 
making an effective sale or being there for the customers. Mm -hmm. It's about the fact that most of your time is going to be spent building a website. It's going to be a I big see. arduous task and it should be enjoyable for you mm. because the, if, if you're going to be miserable in this area, mm -hmm. then you know what? You can be miserable. Once you know what you're doing, building the websites is so fast. It's so not a big problem, big issue. You can build business systems to sell things. It's not a big hassle, but that first site, it's going to take a lot of hours on your part. So it might as well be something either you really enjoy. Mm -hmm. So the time will go really fast or you have a lot of expertise in. So you can actually shrink the amount of time you need to build the site because you don't need to figure all this stuff out. You just know it. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and there's so many things to learn, right? So one, would you say, what, what was the topic that you found the most beneficial? Was it internet marketing or was it something else? Definitely the marketing is the key. And at the end of the day, this is, this is a marketing business. Exactly. And That's marketing has changed so much in the two decades that I've been, I've been in this, but being in there and learning what you're doing and learning all these different tools is just is huge. So, I mean, I, I kind of like to ask this question. So, you know, you've been doing this for so long. Um, how would you condense the knowledge that you've gotten today, if you could speak to Dave from, I don't know, two decades ago and tell him, hey, like, here's what you should be doing right now. What would you, what would you tell him from everything you've learned? Well, it's a funny thing because I wouldn't have necessarily told the Dave from two decades ago to be doing what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. I would have probably told him to do the things that would have worked two years after he you know, so if I was talking to the Dave from 2003, I would have told right. him, here are the strategies you need to know from 2005. If I was right. talking to the Dave from 2005, I'd say, here's the strategies you need for 2007. It's one of those things where doing my strategies today might have been a colossal failure back then. Gotcha, gotcha. That, that's true. And, it's, and I, I guess, especially in this moment in time where things are changing so fast, most people are saying, you know what, like last week is so different to this week. And I'm really just uh, going with it. Uh, as best as I can. Because I remember when the crisis just struck, ad spend went down and everybody stopped cutting spend. And now the people I'm speaking to are saying, you know what, costs are back up again because suddenly everyone's going back and investing because you know they found that e-commerce is not doing so bad. Um, so I guess it's, so, so you, what you're getting at is your point earlier where it, like don't try to predict too much. Right? Hello? Sorry, I, I, we, we lost connection for just a second there. Let's, can you repeat the last question? Sorry, so I was just saying, I guess this is related to your point that you made where you said, don't try to predict too much because things are changing so quickly. I guess then you're really uh, advocating for being someone who adapts as quickly as possible from the data that you have available, limited as it is. Exactly, there are certain strategies that are timeless and there are certain things that are very much as this is what works right now. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really a, a, a balance of them. You know, great customer service is timeless. But certain times, you know, Facebook will look, launch a new ad platform, Google will change its AdWords, and you need to shift to, to adjust to those new standards. And I guess one of the difficult things about this topic too is that the strategies, you know, the ones that are not timeless, that the ones that are very time specific are also, I guess, sensitive to the industry you're in, right? So if you, the, like all the strategies that you've been applying, I guess, work very well for your niche, but somebody listening in couldn't just replicate exactly what you're doing. Um, so um, I'm trying to think, is there any... So for you know, people listening in today, are there any tips that you can share that you know, people could try today um, if they're getting online just to try to maybe shortcut some of their learning? To me, there are definitely certain fundamentals that apply no matter what it is that you're selling. Mm -hmm. So for instance, List building, that's a, big, that's a big area. Even though I have not done much with on, on knobs, truthfully, I'm working on it in different areas, different things that I'm working on. That's kind of a core area. So um, if you're in a business where you're trying to get a lot of repeat customers, you might want to be building your list. To be building your list, you often want to get people landing at a page where they're going to be offered something free. Like what is a 
free resource that somebody would really want, they'd be willing to give their email in order to be, to be getting. It's about building relationship. And that's kind of a core, a core aspect of what we do at the Knobs Company, even though we don't do too much via email, but uh, most people do it largely during, e during email. You want the ear of the person. You want to be back and forth with someone. You want to be building relationship. You want to be building trust. And that's a, that's a core element at any time, I believe. Yeah, and, and, and that's what I've been hearing quite a lot of in terms of advice, especially for now, where it seems like the type of marketing which we do, people are now demanding more of authenticity and they want, they, they, it's not really, it's not so much just about the product that they're buying, where it's transactional, where they want to know who you are, they want to get to know you and it seems like, you know, this building a relationship is, is, is really critical. How are you guys applying this at Nubs? Sorry, the line seems to be pretty so bad. One of the like, biggest ways that we try okay. to build relationships. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I can hear you. One of the ways that we try to build relationships is through our trade professional program. Mm -hmm. So we try to find people who are those who are potentially going to be needing our products often. Contractors, interior designers and such, they have a recurring need for our for our business. So we try to get them into a program where we could be servicing them more. And we try to build a one-on-one -on -one relationship with our, our head of a customer service and these different clients. So that once, once we're interacting with them, it totally changes things. That goes for one-off customers as well. We offer free design consultations, for instance. If somebody is, isn't sure what they want, you know, we have so many products, we have 50,000 different products. It can be very intimidating and someone might not have the greatest sense of, well, what knobs would go with what what kitchen designs, okay, we'll get a free design consultation, we'll get you on the phone, we'll have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. And this is pretty much the opposite of what most e-commerce businesses do. You know, you look at a site like Amazon and you know, they, <laughs> never had an, they never had an 800 number, they never you know, say had a chat, they never did any of these things to get people to interact with them. Their whole model is based on, let's get you to check out with having as little human interaction with us as possible that will keep our costs way down. That was their theory. Now for a business like mine, we kind of go the other way. We say there are so many different businesses you can buy the exact same products from. Therefore, how can we build enough relationship that we're gonna be the ones you choose to buy from? How can we deliver more? How can we offer more service? How can we offer more personal connection? So we actually have a goal to get customers on the phone if they want to talk on the phone, whereas other customers, are, other brands are saying, no, the last thing we want is to have people on the phone, it's too expensive. Mm. We want to set up a one-on-one -on -one phone call because once you talk to us, you're going to build a rapport with us and then there's no way you're going to then turn around and want to buy from somebody else. You're going to want to buy from the people you connected to. So for us, it's how can we build real human connection? Right. I mean, because while you were saying that, I was thinking, uh, you know, people might wonder, okay, but what's to stop someone getting that free consultation and then going somewhere else to get something cheaper? So you already addressed that in your question, where it, it sounds to me like that relationship you're building is that defense against that potential issue. Yeah. And really in our industry, there's not so much going somewhere else to get things cheaper. A lot right. of the manufacturers they dictate to us how much we're allowed to sell the products for. Now mm. we can sell the product for more, but we'd be losing a lot of sales, but we're not allowed to sell for less. It's called a map policy or minimum okay. advertised price. So all of the brand, all of the, the stores are supposed to say, we're all, you know, if this knob sells for $10 retail and we have a 90% map policy, then we're, we can't advertise it for less than $9. So what you're doing so, here is you are deciding to invest more of your margins on that sale, knowing that you'll probably be able to move more in terms of volume by paying exactly. for the I would rather, I would rather have a, a higher, a higher acquisition cost. I'd rather yeah. have, you know, have, have more time per sale devoted into human resources, into human interactions than my competitors in order to build a stronger bond because we both have, we're both going to get the same amount for the sale and I'd rather it come to me. So I'm saying, who, what, who cares if it costs me a bit more in that interaction? I want the sale. Right. And, and, and 
I think I just want to take a little moment here for people listening that it, it's a very intentional decision you've made because you're saying that in your niche, there is this sort of hesitation from customers where they're overwhelmed with the choices. So you felt that there was clearly a need that they had where they didn't know what to pick. Whereas maybe if someone's in another business where it's more transactional, like, I don't know, toothbrushes and toothpaste, there's absolutely no reason for them to be following the strategy. Like it's, it's very intentional, correct? It's very intentional, no question. So and if you have something like toothpaste, by the way. Yeah. So one of the adages in the internet is there's no advantage to being the second cheapest store out there. Right. Now, no, nobody's going to buy from you because you're the second cheapest. There's an advantage to being the cheapest, but beyond that, there really isn't. And one of the, the problems people, people have is that if you're in an industry that's not like mine, which, which has no pricing protections, you can go as low as you want, there's always somebody who's willing to take a sm slimmer margin and charge less mm -hmm. and cut prices even more, which means it becomes really, really hard to make money on commodity-like items like that, where a whole bunch of stores are selling it and you're all racing to have the cheapest price. Much better strategy is to say, how can I add more value? Is there something, if you're selling toothpaste and toothbrushes, is there something else you can include in that that makes it kind of you know, a package that you're getting, you're getting together and it, it makes it feel more valuable, the customer experiences a higher level of value from you? Because sure. if you're selling tooth, toothbrushes and you're selling the same, you know, if you don't, if you manufacture your own or you have got a really unique toothbrush, then maybe you're in a different category. But if you're selling the same Oral-B toothbrush as everybody else, there's no reason someone would buy from you rather than buying from a cheaper competitor. And if you have to be the cheapest, you're going to make nothing on those sales. Right. And, and this is probably one of the big reasons that's driving DTC brands online, right? Because they automatically come with that differentiation. It, it is a unique product right from the manufacturer. And if you don't have that luxury, it sounds like one of the industries like you pick where, for instance, because of the MAP, you are protected from this kind of sort of behavior where it's a race to the bottom. Yeah. Yes. Does that sound right? Or like, is there anything else you'd want to add to that? Yeah, that's definitely yeah. right. Perfect. So um, you meant, I want to dive in a little bit to this idea where you're doing this design consultations to, um, because you, you realize how it's overwhelming for the customer. Is that something that you arrived at because we're going in or is that something which after you ran the business, you realize that, Hey, this is a sticking point for my customers. And if I offer this service, it's going to make it even easier. Was that sort of an organic realization or did you come in with that? Oh, there was nothing I came in with in this business. Everything Wait, excellent. were things I so added what? later. Yeah, sorry, it go really, ahead. It, it came from the fact that people would sometimes call with design questions. Mm -hmm. And when we'd help them, you know, we'd almost always get the sale. So okay. it became a question, how can, we, how can we get a higher percentage of our customers interacting with us? Because when they do, they're sold. Yeah, I mean, that's where I was going with that question, because it looks like you decided to open up as many channels as possible to get in touch with you in order to make the sale. But it seems like it also had this side effect where because people were asking you with their questions, you could see where all the roadblocks or the friction points, so to speak, were, and you could put that back into the website. So is that sort of like a formal process that you had where you... Yes, you want more people contacting you, but you also wanted to make them as comfortable as possible before they contact you, um, if, if that makes any sense, where you build more things on the website. So this is a process that has evolved over 20 years. So mm -hmm. it's, it certainly wasn't started very intentionally, but a lot of trial and error, a lot of putting things up and taking things down and seeing what's been working best. And, and I guess that's sort of like a nice teachable moment for everyone listening, right? Because you mentioned like it's like a game and you, you really have to have fun with it. And this sounds like one of those big, big things. So you try to learn and you try to maybe stick up six, seven, eight ideas on the wall on your website and you see which one's getting traction and then you try to go with that. So it's almost like a constant test and learning iteration process. Exactly. Awesome. Hey, I, I, I think uh, this is a really good time for us to jump in and then have a look at the site um, that, uh, you know, we've been talking about knobs and just talk us through, um, you know, what this final product is, uh, like how everything we've been talking about looks like online.
Okay, great. So let's dive into the screen share here. So this is knobs.co. Mm -hmm. And we can just show you briefly the, 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 main, the main screen. Right at the top, we already try to segment out who are the people are who are trade professionals with, you know, are you a trade pro? We try to join our trade professional programs. You can see here we have one of the splashes, one of the splashes talking about some of our um, public benefit that work we do and one of them talking about, hey, book a one-on-one -on -one design consultation with us, try to get them in right away. And of course, have the chat with one of our, I think that's, that's a picture of Kayla down there, who's the head of our customer service on the chat. And we try to, from that point on, try to go down and say, okay, here are all the, all the various different categories if you wanna be starting in categories. And then I know a few of our featured brands below that. Also then emphasize things like, okay, samples, if we wanna encourage people to buy samples, again, if they, if they buy some products and then get them in their house, see that they're a perfect fit and then come back and order more. See, somebody might be ordering 40 different knobs, 40 mm. knobs, but if they, you don't want them ordering something, looking at it and sending it back, returns are very, very expensive. So I'd much rather they order one each of three different knobs, get to try them out in their house, see which one they really like the best, and then come back and place an order for the 39 other ones that, they, that they're gonna need in the, the style of their choice. Right. And we'll actually give right. them a reimbursement on the ones they didn't choose to help encourage that. And of course, the free shipping offer we have here. But part of what I want to talk about is exactly how we get people to segment down. So one of our big issues is that we have an absolute ton of products. So if you go up here to cabinet hardware, we, we can sell 50,000 different items. So how does somebody decide exactly what they want? So this mm. is what we call a faceted search here. So we've got the main categories, subcategories, finishes, specific finishes, finished class, brands. We have so many different ways that a person can choose what they want. So say you're not looking for knobs, you're looking for pulls. Bam, you're gonna choose, you're gonna click on the pulls and handles and now it's all gonna update. You're only gonna see the, the pulls and handles. And now the subcategories are also, here we go, there's our pop-up asking for if you want a free design consultation. Uh, <laughs> then the, everything else is going to, is going to update so that your, your choices are now different. Let me go down to, you can choose the brand, you can choose the style that you want. This is something here that we, that we added that is a little unusual. So a drill center is the distance between the holes on a cabinet pole. So here on this black one here, you got this one hole hole would be here, the other hole would be here, how far apart are they? It's not the overall length of the pole, because some poles have like this top knob ones in the top right corner, don't stick out past where the screws go. And others, like this one from the elements, the silver one here, do stick out past. But the, the drill center is the distance between the holes. Hmm. Now, there's two reasons a person would search by the drill center, which is why we have two different categories to, to drill down in this area. One of them is just to say that, you know what? I'm looking for a pull of a certain size. Generally, I know I want something about four inches. So they can choose here and they can get their, their length. First, they went to the, the category of three to, three to five inches and now they can, they can choose to even drill down further from there if they want to. But another and this is already I, making a really good point for me on why the design consultations are helpful because I have no idea what a drill center is, but when you explained it to me, it made a lot of sense why I would want to look for it. So like, exactly well, the terms here, right? Yeah. But the, the big reason people search by drill centers is not that because length can also be for what I just described. In fact, people would more likely be ser searching by length for something if they mm -hmm. just want a certain four inch knob or something. Mm -hmm. But the bigger reason people search by drill centers is because they are replacing their, their existing poles and they already have holes drilled in the cabinet. So they need a new item that is gonna fit into the exact same holes that they already have. If somebody's in that circumstance, then they need a very specific drill center. So whereas before we had kind of big categories, okay, three to five inches to help you narrow down how, how big you want, we also have a very, very specific one. And in fact, we can go to show more and you can see there's just many, many, many different drill centers that somebody would wow. use. And we have it so that somebody can look up exactly what their drill center is in the search. So if they wanna do three, 
three and a half, then bam, they're going to be able to get to the, the three. It's not showing up so, so well right now. I got to get rid of that. They're going to be able to get rid of the, the, uh, that and go down to exactly things that are length, the three and a half inch, three got and it. a half inch. And so, so, so it, it reminds me a lot of like, for instance, like an Airbnb kind of experience where you are really just sort of drilling down till you get to the house that you want. Exactly. So that's why it's really important to be doing these things. And another big way that people search is by, is by their finishes. Now with finishes, again, we've got so many finishes. So if you click here, we've got a ton and ton of finishes and a lot of them are, are very similar. So if we look at that, so I just typed in nickel and you'll see there's a huge, huge tons of different nickel. Hmm. You might not know exactly which one you want. And in fact, even if you're in with, you know, satin nickel, if you want satin nickel, there's a whole bunch of satin nickels. Mm -hmm. So it could be that you have a specific finish you want. For instance, a specific brand has a finish called dull satin nickel. And because you've looked at that in that brand, you want to get the matching finish on another piece you're looking for. So that could be one reason why you want to search by the specific finish. But so we also give people the ability to, to search by finish class. And in the finished class, hang on, let me start off with a new search here. Uh, in the finished class, it's going to help you to say, you know what? I don't know exactly what type of nickel I want. I just know that I want nickel. So you can start off already with, with a finished class and say, and just narrow down to the nickel. You don't need to know the specific one. So we want to be able to handle people who are looking for something very specific, like an exactly a you know, three and a third inch drill center. Mm -hmm. And we want and the dull satin nickel finish and at the same time be able to serve, help those who just want, no, I want like a, between a three and a four inch pole and I want it to be a nickel and I don't really, I don't need anything specific. We want to be able to help both of those. So it's, we try to make our search handle both, both aspects of all of the specific needs and also those general needs. Right. So that, you know, Handling a lot, a lot of data is one thing we've put a big focus on in building, the, in building the website. How can we be really good at helping people find their products? You know, with starting with a catalog of 50,000 products, my goal was how can I make, make it so that somebody can click as little as possible until they find the product they want? What does that journey look like? Because I can imagine, like, I mean, personally looking at this, I mean, I've had instances where I've had an old cupboard that I wanted to maybe replace the doorknob on. I would see myself coming, doing, doing a bit of a search and maybe filtering it down to, I don't know, 50 potential knobs. And I might probably want to give you a call. Is that what your typical flow looks like where the website sort of does that initial filter and then still people come to you? Or do you have a pretty good mix of people who just buy everything on the site and then another percentage of people who always have to call. What does that, what does that look like? Definitely a high percentage of people just go and buy, buy things on the site with never getting in touch with us. Okay. Interesting. Are, are there usually repeats or maybe like smaller orders and then the bigger ones always call you? I would not say there's a huge pattern in terms of the, the size of the order and their likelihood to call. They're a really, really big order. They're likely to be in touch. Our main repeat orders come in two categories. One, when somebody is getting a sample and then following right. up with a bigger order. So again, they need the 40 items, but they want to buy three, make sure that they, the item they're, buy, they're choosing really fits their needs, and then they follow up with a second order. And then these products are guaranteed for life, so we're never hearing from this person again. You know, unless they move houses or something, we're not expecting any repeat business. And then there's the repeat business from our, our trade professionals, people who are in this professionally, they flip apartments for a living. Right. And they're, they're constantly buying, buying places and fixing them up, selling them and then starting again. So that person might do four houses a year and they might come back to us over and over again. What you said earlier sounds like a really good diagnostic of why this a faceted search is working really well because if for instance with all of this you still have a lot of people calling you then that's a sign that the website isn't really giving them exactly what they need so all your trial and error seems to have worked pretty well <laughs> it's just different search styles and i think that's a, a really important thing to be to be noting there's not a way that everybody likes to 
to search for things. Some people love having someone hold their hands and take them through and work out a design specifically for them. They love sending pictures of their kitchen and saying what knobs would go well with this. Mm. Others, the last thing they want to do is get on the phone with somebody. They want a process that gives them as little human interaction as possible. They want to take themselves through it. They want to spend as little time shopping as possible. And if they can get, if I can get them to their product, ideal product in five clicks and a competitor takes them eight clicks, then they'd rather be on my site than on theirs. Absolutely. Um, is, I, I think it's also very important to highlight, you, you've already done this, that all of these strategies make sense when you've got a huge product catalog. I mean, if you've got 10 products to sell, then uh, maybe this kind of search doesn't make any sense. But so for people who've got large catalogs, are there anything, is there anything else that you found that works really well? Obviously search is a really big part of it, but um, is there anything else that you, you think is worth sharing? So we didn't go into the actual search bar itself. That okay. was a, a big thing to do. So you can also start not with a category, but with a search. And that's a great way. You definitely want to have good search. You want to have a good way to drill down. One thing we did is we did a lot in terms of categorizing our products. So every manufacturer had their own list of categories and, their own, and such. And we decided to go through and say, you know what, what are some of these, what are some of these styles? You know, which ones are modern, contemporary, transitional, uptown and lower? Like th these are not pieces of information that came from the, from the vendor. They didn't tell us necessarily which ones are French country, which ones are Victorian, because we're dealing with so many manufacturers. We probably carry 30, 40 manufacturers. So we, one thing we would do is we would go and we would add data to what we had from our manufacturers and we would assign styles to the different pieces. So that gives people a different way of, of searching. If someone's saying, you know what, I know that I really want rustic hardware for my kitchen, then bam, they can go and search by style and everything they will get is, is rustic mm. or should be. I don't think these guys climbing up the, uh, it doesn't always work perfectly. I, I love these guys, these manhandles, but I wouldn't call them rustic. So <laughs> <laughs> this, this, is, this is some of the, of the choices that people, that people make. You want to make it as easy for... As Can we try using the search bar? I'm possible. curious now. So if you type rustic, like how, how, how does that work? You, you mentioned that it's... Um, so it's like type ahead. Okay, I see. Rustic, and there you go. You get those rustic knobs. And then again, we have the facets off on the left that will help us drill down even, even more. Gotcha, gotcha. As you notice, the, before nickel was the, the number one finish, in the rustic area, you're gonna see bronze is a more popular finish. It's a more common rustic finish. And in fact, the, you know, the silicon light bronze is the, is the top one that's coming up. This, this looks like it's all from one, from one brand. And especially and with this business, it sounds to me that, I mean, product photos are always very important, but in here, especially because you've got so many different uh, products, the product photo photos are almost critical so that people can tell the difference between things that have a very similar name, right? Oh yeah, photos are absolutely key in this business, no question. Awesome, can we have a look at the uh, product page? Um, I'm assuming you've had to put a lot of work into um, getting all the specs. Absolutely. So here we go. Here's a product page. This one is, you know, it becomes custom made to order in a whole bunch of different finishes. Mm -hmm. But this particular brand, because they're made to order, they couldn't make all the different products and all the different finishes and give us photos of all of them. It would just be absolutely insane. So they give us one product image and then we have, and we could zoom in on it and see it in great detail. These are all, these are all one of a kind pieces, by the way. Like they're, you know, the, this gap here, this little nook you see here, like that's not gonna be the same on every piece you get. It's mm. because they're, they're sand cast pieces, each one's gonna come out a little bit differently. And then you can go and you can get a sample of what the different finishes look like, just a little palette here. These are also, like we said, they're custom made to order. So whereas other products we have will ship the same day, next day, we get our, some of our brands get the products out the door really fast, these, these guys don't. So first thing we want you to see is, we don't want you ordering and then two days later saying, hey, where's my product? You know, people are so used to Amazon Prime these days that if they have to wait for any time at all, it can be a real problem. So we want, first thing we want someone to know that this is a custom made to order product. Lead time is going to be 10 to 12 weeks. 
And that's coming from the manufacturer. So you, you can go and call around 20 different stores. They're all going to give you the same lead time because nobody's holding these in stock. It's all coming from the same, the same factory. And then we, again, we really want to be able to drill down. So where's this coming from? This is coming from the gem collection. So if somebody's buying this knob, I want them to find complementary products as fast as possible. Okay, this one, this particular brand doesn't, doesn't have anything in that, else in that, that, that collection, but I want them to be able to get down to, okay, here's the brand, here's my collection, here's the style, here's the product type, as much detail as, as we can get them. Great. And yeah, you know, you've got like some, I guess a bit of an upsell or um, related product recommendations. Yeah, exactly. So we, related products are big. This, this, let's go to a different brand so we can get a, get a sense of um, how these collections work a bit better because that's, that's an important part of it. So here we go. This is a top knobs in the Ashbury collection. And so if we go to Ashbury, so if somebody's ordering this knob, mm -hmm. very likely they'll want a combination in their kitchen of knobs and pulls. Mm -hmm. now, sometimes people can get away with only pulls, but it's rare you want only knobs because you're going to have big, heavy drawers you know, with your pots and other things. And so people usually prefer a, a pull for that. So if you're going to be ordering this particular knob, you want to then go to the collection and say, okay, you know what? That would go really well with this particular pull they're the exact same finish part of the same collection they're made to go together so it helps the whole shopping process gotcha dave thanks I, I think we've we've uh really got a good sense here especially that you you've really built a website around the way people behave and sort of have it seems like you really try to understand the psychology of how people are when they come to the site and really design it around it and this is, I think, pretty informative for anybody listening in to try to do, emulate the same. Not exactly this, because it's very specific to your business, but at least the, the thinking process. Um, I'm going to stop the screen share. Um, all right. Um, I'm screen share, and are you back? Yes. Sorry, it seems like the internet connection hasn't been too kind to us today, but we, I think we, we went through quite a lot. Um, is there anything else that you think is worth sharing? Any sort of final parting thoughts, if you will? I want to really go back to what we were talking about at the beginning, which is this idea of look at your early ventures into e-commerce as mostly learning experiences. Give a lot of latitude for the fact that you're not most likely going to come out of the gates and hit it, hit it big. So try to fail as quickly as possible. Mm. Like so if, rather, than, rather than having a six months buildup to your launch of your first store and trying to get everything right and only then getting feedback from the marketplace on whether they like it or not, try to do a one week buildup to a store and go like crazy and get a product out there and see how it all works and get feedback from the marketplace and see what, see what works for you, see what doesn't work for you because you're just gonna learn so much faster. The faster you can get things out there, the faster you're gonna learn from it and the quicker your iterations are going to come and the better you're gonna do in the future. Love it, very wise words. Thank you so much, Dave. It's been a pleasure having you. It's been a pleasure being on, take care.